Hello, everyone. <laughs> this is what happens when you put microphones on cartoonists who aren't used to them, so I apologize. Um, so I, you're here to see the amazing Jeff Smith. We thought rather than um, have the usual setup, we would do sort of a round table discussion with Jeff and ask questions for about, have a conversation for about 45 minutes. I have a few slides. And then we will open it up in the last 10 minutes for questions from the audience. And then after that, Jeff will be signing books in the Great Hall. So I'm here with my friend uh, Lex Fajardo, who He's in charge of publishing at the Schultz Studio, which is down the street from here. And uh, my name's Paige Braddock, and I'm the creative director at the Schultz Studio. And um, And between us is Jeff Smith, who is a cartoonist. I am. <laughs> uh, this way you can see the slides. Uh, he is best known for creating the self-published comic book series, Bone. <clears throat> Bone has won numerous American awards, including 10 Eisner Awards and 11 Harveys, as well as European awards from Italy, Germany, and the French Alf Art. Now, I don't know what that last one is, but if you're a cartoonist and you're big in France, then you're big. Yeah. I know that much. That's the big one in France. That's... Yeah. Um, in 2005, Bone was published in color by graphics and imprint of Scholastic Books, reaching a whole new audience of kids. There have been exhibitions of Jeff's work, and in 2009, Jeff was the subject of an Emmy award-winning documentary called The Cartoonist, Jeff Smith, Bone, and the Changing Face of Comics. In 2013, Jeff guest edited the Best American Comics Anthology and released his second major work, Razzle, a dark, hard-boiled sci-fi story that focuses on an art thief who hops through dimensional barriers hiding out on various parallel worlds. That's the one I was telling you. I started drinking bourbon while I was <laughs> it's working on that one. One of Jeff's newest projects is Tukey. Um, it was originally serialized online and then collected into books and is temporarily on a break, but will be coming back. Yes. Um, Tukey is a Pleistocene era story that takes place two million years ago during the first big ice age. This story is about the first human to leave Africa and the forces that tried to stop him, including ancient gods and predatory animals. Some of Jeff's later works also include critically acclaimed Shazam, The Monster Society of Evil, and Little Mouse Gets Ready, an award-winning comic for emerging readers. Now that we're all appropriately intimidated. <laughs> including me. <laughs> I'd like to ask a couple of quick warm-up questions to sort of uh, you know, put us at ease and kick off our bigger discussion. Which do you prefer, pancakes or waffles? Pancakes. Pancakes, wow. They sort of... Oh, I, 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 I was right. right. I got the right one. If you could fill up an empty swimming pool with anything and jump in, what would it be? Oh, uh, comic books. <laughs> One day, you're walking in the forest, and you come across a magical, very wise, talking frog. What question would you ask him? You can talk? <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I did not study for this. <laughs> I could have given him a heads up, but it's more fun to see like the off the cuff. Um, so in this series, <laughs> I look at this and I see a cartoonist who has literally, <laughs> has literally lost his shirt doing comics. And, and now he is wandering lost in the desert. And um, I just wonder if you could talk about this. Um, these, <laughs> this is for Rassel. Uh, it's a story that takes, yes, <laughs> takes place in the desert. And uh, those were reference photos. And it, it was really hot. It was like 110 degrees. And, um, in the comic, I put the shirt on, back on him, but. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I apologize for doing that, but I saw those photos and I go, I have to use yeah, those no, photos. Yeah, no, that's all right. Um, I have a few questions, Are you but done? do you want to jump in? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. We can. Uh... Well, I think, I think our first question uh, was, when did you know you wanted to be a cartoonist? <laughs> Uh, probably had my, I was probably on that path uh, very early. 
I loved comics. My dad used to read uh, the Sunday papers to me, and Penis was a big favorite. Uh, in fact, when, when my dad wasn't there, uh, that's how I learned to read was Peanuts. And I actually saw the first book. It was um, in, the, in the archives over here at the museum. It was a Fawcett book called For the Love of Peanuts, and they had a copy of it. Uh, and that was the book. I, I remember going, my dad's not here, and I got I to gotta read Peanuts. So I, it took me about two days. I had taught myself to read from that. I don't remember what we were talking about. Oh, I, 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 I was aware that there were cartoonists. Like I knew that, I knew that Walt Disney made up Mickey Mouse, and I knew that uh, Charles Schultz, Charles M. Schultz made up Snoopy and Peanuts. Uh, so I wanted to make one too. I wanted to make up my own character. So as early as five, I was making experimental cartoon characters, and Bone was one of them uh, from that time. And he kind of just stuck with me. I forgot to make him an animal, though. You know, Snoopy's a dog, right. Mickey's a mouse, Bugs is a bunny, phone, bone's a bone. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot to give him a nose. But they've been with you since you were like five or six? Five, yeah. OK. And then, uh, so you mentioned Schultz. And uh, I know another one of your big influences is Walt Kelly. Mm. And talking earlier, you had also mentioned uh, E.C. Seeger of Popeye. Right. And I'm just wondering, uh, were those styles that you just sort of gravitated to on your own? Did you seek them out? How did you discover these guys? Well, the, I mean, when I, I grew up in the 60s. So um, I mean, the funny papers were really still really a really big deal and would be for another 25, 30 years. Uh, and you know, Walt Disney was still alive. And so he was on television every Sunday. And so his films were, I just, I just love that kind of traditional American cartoon character with the three fingers and the big nose and the big feet. In fact, I think they call it big nose, big feet style of cartooning. Um, so I, I just gravitated toward that. But at the same time, there was still uh, Mad Magazine where you could see Don Martin and kind of crazy, very individualistic styles. And um, I, I was just, I don't know, I just, I just loved cartooning. Uh, before oh, before we talk about that, I was, yeah. since I already kind of jumped the gun and showed the, the razzle slide, I was going to say, what was it like to go from doing this sort of this work that you've been doing for how many years, Bone? Like, well, Bone proper as a published book that people could see, it was about it was about thirteen years. So um, then you transition to this completely tonally subject matter is completely different in Razzle, and mm. it, but it didn't feel didn't feel calculated. It didn't feel like you were doing it for some commercial reason. It sort of felt like you were just oh, following your interests. I didn't interest. do it for a commercial reason. Yeah, so I just. <laughs> it did not sell as well as Bone. Well, I was just wondering well, if, you okay. got, I don't care. if you got blowback from like. I did. Uh, I, I did. I think a lot of people did think that I was being calculating, not for a commercial reason, but that I had some kind of like, well, I did this book and I, I'm going to try to do something completely opposite just to make a point or something. But the truth is, I'd be inking, you know, late into the wee hours. And once you've written the, the book and you've made thumbnails and you pencil it, by the time I get to inking, I've already drawn it like three or four times. And I could have my laptop open and I would be watching um, movies, right. especially movies that had like commentary by the directors and things like that. I love that kind of stuff. Uh, but I really got into watching noir and Humphrey Bogart. And so that's what I was watching, and that's, when, that's why I wanted to make my next thing sort of like that. And also a, kind of an armchair physics buff. So I'm really fascinated by like Cosmos and Brian Greene's stuff. Uh, and so I decided to mix Humphrey Bogart and Blade Runner, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, I put, hey, I put Bugs Bunny and the Lord of the Rings together, and it worked. I, was I, say, I could jump ahead. I could jump ahead to these slides because it's totally different than. Uh, sorry, Lex. I'm just yeah. upending our plan. <laughs> I love to do that to Lex. Uh, there he is with his shirt in the desert. Yes. yes. Um, really great use of uh, light, though. I always one of the things that I've always been a huge fan of you is your ability to do these complex scenes just using black and white. Mm. Like that one right there. Yeah. Um, I had a little girl who's probably here. She is. One. She's right in the front row that drew those. Go back to those rat creatures. She drew me a picture just like that. Wow. See all the rat creatures? 
Well, this is well. You can go back to that one page. <laughs> so let's go back to the rat creatures. Because um, so one thing I did recently is I reread the thirteen hundred page oh, epic geez. of Bone. <laughs> and Don't I drop made, that. Oh. I made some notes, <laughs> and I thought maybe we could just go page by page. Sure. Um, but uh, the other. So I, I thought I'd, I'd highlight a couple things that struck me as a cartoonist because we're all three cartoon nerds up here. Um, so in no particular order, you know, the, as Paige mentioned before, with Razzle, it's a different tone. And Bone has a variety of tones through the book. So I, I, I sort of highlighted these two slides. On one slide, we've got, you know, the now famous stupid, stupid rat creatures moment in Bone with, you know, the two bumbling rat creatures, which is comedic and funny and hilarious. But then, you know, at the same time, these guys are scary. Mm. So when, when you were creating Bone, was that something you were consciously thinking of, like balancing that tone? Was that really a challenge? What was your... Yeah, approach? I think the idea was um, people like this. Uh, generally, if they're out by themselves, they're not that dangerous. They're not very smart. But you get them in big numbers, uh, and they start getting control of things. It's, it's bad news. That was the idea. And I also, I think when I started out, I only had the, the mass of rat creatures that were just coming at you all the time. And I thought, I need to give them some kind of personality to, so that they're not just this nothing, so that they have some kind of, some kind of base of somewhere you can hook onto them. So that's why I pulled these two out and, I don't know, made them bicker. That, I, they fight over quiche, like one wants to make quiche and one doesn't. Right. I'll tell you where that came from. The, when I was in college in the early 80s, there was a book called Real Men Don't Eat Quiche. <laughs> and it was a, it was a silly little like, novelty novel that nobody even remembers anymore. But I just took that and said, real monsters don't eat quiche, right. and took off from that. Nice. The, uh, actually, that's another thing. The mob mentality, you kind of bring that into the villagers, too, often. Mm, mm, yeah, yeah. And was that something uh, that you sort of intended with, uh, with the stories to sort of show Yeah, I mean, I've always felt like there are people in many fields of, of life that are, they try to build their own power base by uh, creating divisions between everybody else. And then certainly Phony Bone it was, it was, uh, was doing that, for sure. He had his own goals. He wanted power. He wanted everybody's money. Uh, and he found out that they were scared of dragons. So instead of you know, trying to do something constructive, he just b worked on their fear until pretty soon they were just all giving him his money. I never, nothing like that goes on today, though. So right. it's a, you don't have to worry about that. <laughs> Uh, this one I, I picked out just because, uh, as a cartoonist, I know how hard it is to draw rain. And I know Schultz was a master at rain. And this is gorgeous rain, too. And I just didn't know if you had any tips for us who want to draw rain really well. I, I think Schultz was uh, an influence on the rain. He just really went for the lines. The, what, the only thing I did a little bit differently is before I went in with the lines, I would actually do a few drops that were big enough to see and get them kind of spread out evenly over the scene and maybe draw them over the people. And then I can't remember, I kind of didn't go over the, yeah, I did do that. Uh, but I would like white out where it was going over black and then at the end do the rain. Uh, I can't remember why I did that. I do remember there was a scene at night in a lightning storm. This is that one. Oh. And that way, the rain, I only drew the, oh, there's somebody who remembers that scene. Uh, I only drew scene. the rain like around the characters, like as if, I, I, just like in the old noir movies, the rain, it was almost like the lights that they were using to light the movie. You could only see the rain coming through that. Right. And I just used that as if moonlight was snaking in or lightning or something like that. Well, I mean, this is a whole issue where yes. Bone and Thorn and Grandma are moving through the forest. Um, I think it's wordless. It's the most nearly part. wordless, yeah. yeah. And it was, it was a kind of an experiment I was trying to see. I would, they start running away from the rat creatures in the dark woods, trying to hide from them and escape from them. Uh, and they get from one end of the woods to the other and over the course of the whole comic book. And I wanted to see if I could make the time it took to read the comic book be the same as how long it took them to get to the other end of the forest. So it's sort of like happening in real time. Uh, it was it was hard, and I only did it that one time. <laughs> how did you, uh, again, sort of to, to the 
the black and white, how did you, I just look at this page and I don't know how you envision it. The, the light off the rock and then sort of almost in that panel with bone looking down, almost like three dimensional rain coming down. It's just. Uh, that was fun. That was, I actually was trying to get that like, you're on the last two pot panels. So you're looking up at phone bone. So the rain is kind of, kind of coming around you in perspective, and then back to his viewpoint, so the rain's now going down. Right. Uh, just, to, just to throw you off a little bit. Yeah, no, it works. Oh, and then this one. Um, Those are, these are really serious, cartoony questions. Yeah, I, I know. I, I'm, I'm digging figured, it. I figured I'm digging it. this is my opportunity yeah. to nerd out. So <laughs> you'll have to, hopefully, I, I feel like there are a lot of cartoon nerds in the audience, too, so they'll appreciate this. Uh, so this one struck me because, well, A, the lettering is great, and another Terrific letter, of course, was Schultz. Um, so I wanted to sort of pick your brain about lettering, but also the hooded one is so creepy with that word balloon emanating from under the shroud. How did you come up with that? Do you know, I don't remember. I don't remember. I think I was trying to be creepy, but I don't remember why I thought that would help. Yeah. It would just. It works. It, that, it, does, it does make it creepy. I would say that was probably more a Walt Kelly kind of a lettering balloon trick. Mm -hmm. Kelly was. Much more into like like P.T. Barnum would talk, and he would actually letter it in you know, 19th century circus poster lettering, and and chain you know, and the balloon was like pinned up like a like a like a poster. That might have been more of a Walt Kelly kind of a trick. And um, when you were doing Bone, I have plenty of Sparky tricks though. A lot, a lot of times when my characters scream, they're just big scratchy letters. Right. They're just like, well. They don't look like Schultz, but they look like me trying to do Schultz. <laughs> but this is all hand lettered, correct? Uh, at this point, it was still hand lettered. At, around this issue, um, my wife got tired of hearing me swear in the other room. And she um, got a, a software program called Fontographer. And she said, do your whole alphabet out twice, once bold, once regular, and explanation points and stuff. And she was able to put it in, and I could just type it. Oh, wow. And that was great because no more, you know, not having enough room and starting to go up or having to white out. Do you still hand letter? No, I have a font as okay. well because it's just, it's easier in editing too. Yeah. Uh, so this one, this is the great cow race. I think everybody remembers this scene and uh, mm -hmm. masterful cartooning. Yeah, great um, stuff right there. Cows are really hard to draw. How did you do that? I, I bought a toy cow. <laughs> 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 It was a really goofy one, and I could, it had a slight posability. So I just looked at that and, and went from that. This was before Google Image, when you could just look at a cow online. And what does a cow look like when he's running? So do you have a morgue, so to speak, like before Google Image? Like, is there, that's another thing cartoonists have sometimes is they call them morgues, and they're like, sometimes they're JC Penny catalogs and just yeah. things to reference. Did you have one yeah, of those? A little bit, yeah. yeah. Like, uh, I, I still have files that, uh, from each issue of the book. And there are some of them have, you know, pictures I've printed out or ripped out of magazines and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think I have the toy cow anymore. No. Oh, okay. <laughs> you can put them up next to the dragon. Yeah. So now we're back to this one. Now back to Rassel. Yeah. Which stands for Romance at the Speed of Light. I wondered what that stood for. <laughs> um, so when you did this one, uh, did you do it knowing it was going to be colored or anticipating it would be in color? Because no, I, I felt I, like some of the blacks were a little bit less or handled differently or uh, no I usually tried to I tried to draw the same whether I th was going to do in color or not oh, okay uh, and I didn't know if this was going to be in color until literally three months before I had to go to press for the big for the final version of it um, but the guy who colored bone who used to work with me at my studio he really wanted to color it but I, I was like, well, you, have to, you can't color it the same way as Bone. This is a very different book. I mean, right. it's got a different feel, attitude, tone. And three months before the deadline, he came up with this palette that was rich and dark and smoky. And I was like, that's it. And also, he figured out a way to layer textures underneath the Photoshop so it didn't look so much just like Photoshop. It looked sometimes watercolored, and you, you stopped thinking about the color, which is what I want people to do. Uh, and he colored 500 pages in three months. Bless his heart. I don't know how he did it. But it was, it was brilliant. He did a really good job. I'm not sure if I, no, I didn't. I, for some reason, I, did, I only had the black and whites from this story. But it's a really complex story that um, 
and, and he made it all work and you brought it all together at the end. And I read an interview somewhere where you said you actually figure out the ending first. Always, yeah. And I just the, wonder if you could talk about that a little bit. That's uh, Well, I've, I, I really enjoy large epics. And um, comic books and even comic strips, for the most part, are just you know kind of like the endless, the endless thing. I mean, uh, like Sparky drew Charlie Brown for 50 years, and he's still I don't know what, how old is he, seven, eight, okay, and still wearing the same shirt, which is wonderful. I mean, we love that. That we that's part of why that works. But I like the idea of actually having a, a single story. So that's why I haven't done much with Bone once the story ended, because I, I got there, that I wanted to right. do that book. Uh, and writing is just, if you know what the ending is, you look a lot smarter when you get there. You know? <laughs> it's, I, I mean, I did a lot of spontaneous stuff as I went. I was going to say, because like, if I write a longer story, I mean, when I do Jane's World, it's totally by the seat of my pants. I never know what's going to happen from one month to next. Jane's World, by the way, is a great comic. Thank you. Very thank good you. Comic. But that's, that's why it's comic. sort of cathartic to me. You can clap for that. Yeah. You can clap for thank that. Thank you. <laughs> it's, sort of, it's sort of fun that way, because I'm just responding to whatever mood I'm in at the time. But for a bigger story, um, I was just wondering if you allow yourself to take some side trips that you didn't anticipate. Because once you flesh out the characters, sometimes they present a storyline that they want. They almost like start talking to you. Like they want the story to go in a different path. I had a lot of things happen like that. Uh, uh, for one thing, Grandma Ben in the original outline was going to die in, in Act 3. Mm -hmm. uh, but by the time, and, and I thought, well, in order to make it matter, I'm going to really make people like her. So I really built up her, I, the cow race, the, you know, I just, I really put a lot of effort into liking her. And then it, when it came time, I was like, I like her. I can't kill her. <laughs> I like her. <laughs> Lucius, come here. <laughs> uh, and that actually ended up working for the betterment of the story. I mean, um, there are ways to compare Bone to certain kind of, you know, myths and stories like that. And one of them is uh, the Holy Grail. That was one of my things I was pattering it after. And uh, right then I realized Lucius was the Grail King. I mean, I had literally even wounded him in the thigh by, uh, he f was fighting Rockjaw. So he was, and he was kind of a broken man and, and he was the older generation and the land had been laid waste and I'm like, holy moly, I'm doing the Holy Grail. And it's Lucius that ha has to go. So he's the one who stepped up and took grandma's place. That's cool when that happens. Yeah, that it was, and, and uh, thanks, Grandma. <laughs> uh, can I just piggyback on that question? Because you, you like these big epics. You're like we said, this is bonus 1,300 pages. Razzle was 500. 500. Short story. Short story. Yeah. But are there ever moments when you're in the thick of it, where maybe you can't see the end? Like you get stuck in, and you know, this is also connected to another question or notion that Bone is one of those books now where it's perennially in the top 100 of greatest graphic novels and this and, and, and it's always on these lists with Mouse and Watchmen and Dark Knight and, and rightfully so. But um, so I think for to a certain degree we take that for granted. But when you're there at the you know in the middle of this story, were there moments where you thought, I don't think I'm gonna get this done? And how did oh. Yes. Um, well I'll, I'll tell you I'll give you two answers. Because uh, first an example of when I, I I made up the ending of Tukey before I started. I, I, mean, I really think like, like you got I got these characters, I want them. I might have a couple of images in my head that, I, that are kind of like what I want to draw. That's why I'm doing this story. But I, then I got to work on the ending because until I have the ending, I don't know if it's a story worth telling. So if I have an ending that I feel like that's, that's, that works, then I kind of work backwards and fill in these the, from the beginning to the end. And I was doing Tukey online. And it wasn't so much that I questioned my ending, but I got about 100 pages into it, and I realized I know who these characters are, and I know the story I should be telling. So I, about 100 pages in, I took it down offline, and I'm kind of reorganizing it to, to do a first collection of it. So that's one example where, yeah, my plan to, does, isn't always perfect. So I had to pull that. And the other story where I really thought I might not finish it was um, sometime around 2002, um, I, had, I had started publishing another cartoonist. Uh, I had done a bunch of toys, and some of the toys, I was doing it myself, and a lot of money was still tied up. Uh, I made my money back eventually, but for a long time, 
the cash was frozen. And then we had a, we had a bunch of other circumstances that were money suddenly became very scarce. We had like a landlord that went crazy and was like trying to sue us for money, uh, which we won that also. But, but there was this period where everything went south. And uh, we, th we thought it, we were going to lose it. We had, to, we had an office, I, Vijaya, my partner. Uh, we had three, three full-time employees. And we had to let them all go. No, that's not true. We let two of them go, and we kept our assistant, Kathleen, who is still with us to this day. And the three of us moved. We, got, we had to lose our office, because the landlord was mad. And we, our lawyer said, get every friend you know in a U-Haul, and I want you out of that building by morning. I don't want anything left there except a broom in the corner. And I had a lot of good friends, apparently, because they came, got us out of there, moved us up into my, I had a one-room garage apartment that was my personal studio. And I had Kathleen and Vijaya and I, all of us up there. We were crammed in there. We had all the office equipment in the garage. When you wanted to make a copy, you had to go downstairs and open the garage door so you could make a copy. <laughs> Uh, but there was a moment that got really bad where um, I think we all started to think this we're not going to survive this. And I mean, Kathleen started looking for jobs as an editor and other publishers. And and I remember one particular night. It was I was I was I was working on like the penultimate bone graphic novel, Treasure Hunters. And I was and I was actually finishing it and getting it ready to go to the printers. But I'm like I'm not going to get to do the last book. I'm so close that this really isn't going to happen. And then. In 2002, the librarians held their American Library Conference, their national conference. I think it was in Atlanta, but I'm not positive. Uh, but they, their focus was graphic novels. And they invited me, Art Spiegelman, Neil Gaiman, Colleen Doran, and a librarian, Stephen Weiner, to give a talk. And we went there thinking, oh, this is it. We're finally going to you know, break out of it. Because right back then, we weren't in libraries. We weren't allowed to sell on Amazon. We, uh, we, I mean, a, library, a baker and tailor that distributes to libraries wouldn't sell my book because it was a cartoon and it was self-published. So then um, the librarian suddenly said, we can sell a lot of these books. They invited us there. They didn't need to be talked into it. They knew that graphic novels was it. And that was the turning point. Suddenly, all librarians and bookstores started carrying it. And through graphic novels, I was able to hire back my staff and, and get a place. <laughs> so it had, had a happy ending, but it had a very scary, it was a scary moment there. My, Mo Willems said something about librarians the last time he was here, about that they have the least money and the most power in the book they industry. They do. <laughs> they do. And I'm also on the board of the Common Book Legal Defense Fund. And librarians are the front line of the First Amendment, for sure. Fearless people. Yeah, I've uh, I've renewed my library card. <laughs> Snoopy's actually been partnering with the library association so for the last couple of years. Uh, well, but prior to that though, you had been collecting bone as a trade, so yes. which is different from the general just as a single comic book, uh, which kind of led me to my other question was that you, you seem to understand the landscape of comics really? I mean, Bone is, is great on its own as, as just the art and the story, but there's like a whole other half to this, which is business. And, and yeah. did you learn that along the way? Was that something you had to take some hard knocks with? What was that? I, I did take some hard knocks. My wife uh, was a cartoonist fan. She's a cartoon fan and loves comics. She liked my comic. Uh, she became my partner and helped me set up the whole company and helped me write the business plan. Uh, she always did the books. She does licensing. Um, so we did it together. We just marched into this field of comics. And from the beginning, my goal was to have collections, because I was a fan of Sparky's. I loved the Peanuts books. I learned to read from them. I loved Pogo books. I was a huge fan of the books. So Calvin Hobbes at that time was doing the collections. So I wanted to make a collection just like that. And that was, there was a lot of resistance in the comic book world. There were graphic novels before me, for sure. I mean, uh, yeah, there was, there was quite a few of them. But actually, they were, most of them were just one-offs. Uh, it was only when Mouse, Watchmen, and Dark Knight came out in 86 that they kind of had a little bit of legs, and they stayed on the shelf. But nobody really ever followed it up. The only follow-ups to them were 
corporate versions where Marvel would just cram a bunch of Wolverine stories in a, a collection. So it was, but those three books in 1986 really inspired people like me and Neil Gaiman, and I assume Chris Ware too, to a degree. And we're the we're the people that went ah. You've shown us the way. Mm -hmm. So we, that's when we started doing it. And when we went into it, the comic book stores didn't want them. They're, they thought of them as expensive. But we thought, well, we want to keep our work in print. So, and so this actually would be like a bookstore instead of a newsstand, which is how they were running back then. The comic book's up until the next issue comes in. They take that one down and put it in a box, never to be seen again. And that was it. We were like, no, keep it in print. You'll make money on it for years. You started in animation, though, right? I yes. mean, yeah, before the books. And so were you and Terry Moore, because I, I don't know my timelines, but did he start self-publishing, too, after yes, you? Yes, right or around. about at the same time? Just about the same time, maybe a little bit after, but very close. Yeah. Uh, I met him. I did a comic book store signing in Texas, and he was, they said, this is our local guy. And he, he sat right next to me, and he was, we hit it off. We've been best friends, and we've actually shared a booth at the San Diego Comic-Con for 20 years or something. Yeah, you guys are usually neighbors. Yeah. Um, Terry Moore, he does a book. He did a, a book called Strangers in Paradise, and then the second one was called, um, oh gosh. Echo? Echo, oh, yes. Oh, Rachel Rising? I think Echo was first announced, Rachel Rising. Yeah, so he's done a, huh? Oh, yeah, now Motor Girl. Motor Girl, yeah, sorry. Which that's, that's turning out to be kind of trippy, isn't it? <laughs> I accused him of just wanting to draw girls, a big giant ape, and vintage cars in the desert, and that's kind of the story. I mean, that's that sounds good to me. <laughs> it's kind of like tornadoes and sharks, or dinosaurs and trains. It's like. <laughs> um, so, do you ever get stuck when you're writing a story? Like, even though you know the ending, and you're you're going down this path, like, do you ever find yourself? in a corner with a story. Yeah, definitely. And, um, and I don't remember who gave me this, this advice, but it was good. It's like, if you, get, if you get stuck, just go back, just back up to the last time it was working <laughs> and read up to that point again and see if you go in a different direction. Oh, that's a good, and that was that's a good really advice. good, oh, it saves days of problems. Because you sit there and argue and work with the, this little clunky thing that kind of went off the rails or isn't quite what you thought. And that way, you just go back to the last place where it you know, sweet up to this point, go to a different direction. So that's a perfect segue into your ring and the pendant you're wearing that has the maze. And you were talking about it last yeah. night. About Part of my research into Rassel was to go out to, I knew part of noir is, um, is the maze that it's, but it's you know the city usually re represents you know the man man-made maze that you it represents the soul of this guy who's lost, uh, and but it really comes down to just man. It's a very prim primal type of a story, so I decided to do it out in the desert, and I was familiar with uh, um, the desert around Tucson, and I went out there for a couple of weeks. My brother-in-law lived there, so I stayed with him, and I went out into the desert every day for a couple of weeks out in the Sonoran Desert. And I also did a bunch of research on the Native Americans that lived there, and particularly right near there were the Pima. But all the Southwest Indian tribes almost use this thing called the Man in the Maze, uh, which is their elder brother character, the, the, their god. Uh, and it either represents him entering a maze of his hidden mountain home, or it represents man in general going on the path of life, and as you go around this tinier and tinier, tightler spiral to the middle, the twists and turns come faster and quicker, just like in life as you make these decisions. And apparently when you get to the center, it's some momentous moment, like either death or marriage or puberty, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so for that story, I know that's not the slide I have up right now, so forgive me, audience, uh, bearing with my unorganized slide presentation. but. Um, there was a lot of science in that book, right? So I mean, um, you had to do a lot of research into. I did. I did uh, two years of research on physics and the ideas of real theoretical physics about parallel universes, which is a real thing. And then I did two years of basically studying the 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 art form of noir and conspiracy theories around Nikola Tesla. And there is a lot of them. In fact, I think every conspiracy theory we have 
UFOs, you name it, all goes back somehow to Nikola Tesla. It's crazy. I'm going to look into this now. I, I, well, I, put them all, I put them, just about all of them in the Rassel, too. What's the, the research you're doing for Tukey, then? Tukey is um, paleontological. It's, uh, I'm very interested in evolution uh, and origins of, of human life. And about two million years ago, there was a moment when not just, it was just before Homo sapiens, but it, there was Australopithecus, that was Lucy, named not after Lucy, but after Lucy in the sky. Uh, there was um, the hominids, which was like Homo habilis, who was the first real tool maker with that big triangle ax. And there was also Homo erectus, which is really our first true early ancestor. It uh, actually looks like, a, like would, uh, Homo erectus could get on a bus and put him in a suit and give him a shave, and you, would just, you wouldn't really notice him. They had lost body hair, had the slim belly, because they were using fire. They were cooking with fire. But the, 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 but the earlier family members of the human species, uh, they still looked, they walked upright, but they still looked fairly simian. But then um, they didn't make it, and Homo erectus did. And I just thought, that story where they're all on the earth at the same time, and our direct ancestor is using fire to eat. That would freak everybody else out, and they would want to stop them. I thought that was, might be a good story. It was, it was interesting, too, because it was the period you're talking about. It was like all the water was like locked up in the polar caps, right? So yeah. Africa got really dry. So that's why he finally yeah, left, Yeah, you know, right? I actually, yes, the, the actual scientific part of that's it is that Cliff two Nets million years ago, um, there was a, a really massive ice age, and all the water on the planet was stuck in the poles and the ice. So the middle of the planet was dry and dusty. And that's where all the jungles that our ancestors were living in started to disappear. We just had grasslands. Um, I, I, ended, I used to introduce the book that way, but I've decided to take that out. This is one of the things I'm reorganizing. Mm. Because instead of trying to give it this scientific basis, I decided to scrap that and just go with it. Here's the story. Here's the characters. And kind of introduce, uh, let you know that there's a drought, but not explain, not try to Right. Do you see what I'm saying? Right, yeah. I, kinda, I thought it took some of the fun out of it by yeah. saying it was a story. Right, like the just... showing versus telling versus showing. Yeah, kind of exactly. Thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how did people lose their hair and the belly? Does that have to do with the fire thing? No, no it has to do with uh, standing up and the, the drier heat. And they could, they could walk and run, and they could sweat better. Instead of sweating like an animal by panting, they could sweat through their skin, and they had to get rid of their hair. And that you know how they know how? I mean, This is what I'm dying to know. I, you are dying to know this. Um, we've all eaten lunch, right? OK. Yeah. The, we know when our ancestors lost their hair because there's, they can trace um, through animals, through their DNA, there are certain markers that when they share them, they have these similar markers. But then when they split, they have different ones. Well, they were able to get the to, to do pubic lice versus head lice. OK, head lice didn't exist until 2 million years ago. And they only happen after this big bear space. And they happened. just, and they had to jump. some of them stayed in their place. I'm really sorry I asked that question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to be able to forget that now. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Also, the, the Lex is sitting over there going. Lex is sitting over there going. Can't we talk about brushes and nibs now? And what kind of paper you draw on? Let's talk about that. Okay. All right. Two ply bristle. Two ply bristle. How big do you draw? Do you draw a lot bigger than the? <laughs> trying to forget that. Uh, um, yes, I draw. I about double up. Two, two times up. Okay. So my live area is about ten by fifteen. And do you use a brush or a, a pen? I, I still draw with a, I, similar if anybody saw uh, Jarrett this morning, I use a blue pencil on paper and I use a dip, uh, I used a, a, a brush, like a watercolor drop brush. Yeah, yeah you, get, you can get that nice wall, Kelly thicks and thins. Right. I just use a number one uh, uh, Winsor Newton sable hair brush. Mm. Uh, I'd have, to, I'd have to, what, what else do you want to talk about? No, were you going to say something else? Oh, no, I'm, I tapped out at lice, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, so now that you're working on Tukey, 
Yeah. Is because we sort of I think we established with Bone and some of the Razzle clips is that you're clearly a master of black and white. Are you thinking still in terms of black and white? Will Tukey be color? Does that affect the way you create well, a page? Well, I, I have I had colored it to put it online, and I'm now now that I'm actually redrawing and adding pages, I'm having a lot of fun, and I'm thinking. I might want to go back to black and white. It, I think Tukey looks pretty good in black and white. He do, it does look good in black and white. I actually have the black and white book. But yeah. I guess I pulled these because they were in color online, mm -hmm. maybe. Yeah, and uh, but sometimes I do, and this I, I did this in the Captain Marvel DC book, the Shazam book. But I'm doing it a little bit in Tukey, and I'm, I know like I could do some cool things with skies mm -hmm. if I do it in color. So I can like do a night sky. That that has some really yeah. good sky color. Yeah, I mean that's a, I mean that's dawn, and I mean you can you can't really tell it's dawn in black and white. So that's one that's the kind of thing that I am that that colored by Tom Gott. Uh, he, he did a pretty good job with that, I think. So you were you were saying you're not going to do it. Did I make this up, or did you say you're not going to do this online anymore? Was there were you like testing out sort of publishing online and then deciding mm -hmm. that maybe that's not your thing? Or? That's, a, that's exactly it. It's that simple. I was putting the like a page up, maybe a couple a week or maybe once a week or something, and uh, I didn't. I, I knew people doing it that were doing really well at it, like Kate Beaton um, or S Scott Kurtz, and these guys are making a living at it. I mean, they're doing really well. Uh, so I thought, well, let me see what it is. I, but I, I didn't really get what they were. I didn't see like a lot of, it wasn't like I had 100 people commenting and liking right, it or anything. Right. It is hard but to tell. I had no idea what, was, what the impact was or what anybody really thought about it. And the worst thing was I had this brilliant idea that I was going to do it landscaped, and each one was going to be like a Sunday comic. Well, it was going to be like a Prince Valiant. or. A... I think that's what I liked about it, though. Well, it was really fun to do, but then when you strung it together in a published book, it had a real uneven start-stop. So uh, now, I, now what I've been doing is I've been filling in. I've been adding extra pages to kind of smooth things out. Does it, does it for bookstores, is it a problem that the orientation of the cover is different than the orientation I think it'll be okay. of the book? I think it'll be okay in the bookstores because I can probably make like a Something's more like a 10 by 10, more like a children's book size. And I think I'll be able to have them be horizontal within that space. Probably OK. And that'll be through your cartoon books line? Maybe. I'm, I, might, I might shop it around. I'm starting to think it's looking pretty, yeah. pretty good. So. But, you've, but you've in, you enjoy self-publishing. The, the process of that, or is that just sort of something that you fell into? Because these well, days I could, you Well, can... I could. I mean, with, yeah, my wife, one of her gigs is that she licenses uh, my comics. She, like, she licensed Bone to Scholastic for, to do color in America and in uh, Canada, mm -hmm. uh, North America, basically. And, but we still publish the black and white one volume. And she's licensed it in like 33 languages okay. around the world. And they do it, either do it in black and white or in color, because we own the color. But. So um, what were we talking about? Well, I think we're we're almost going to open up to questions. But yeah, I was going to. Oh. I, I just uh, I had one more question. Oh, but, okay. Uh, and this was something that uh, was you were, it was on a panel with you in San Diego a couple year, several years ago, and you always said something that really struck me as interesting. And we didn't get and in, in the course of the panel, it got talked over or anything. But you said something that stories should have a moral point of view, and I didn't know if you could tease that out a little bit. What what you kind of meant by, by that. It's always sort of just rolled around in my brain. And now that I have you, I could pin you on. I, well, I don't, have a, I don't have a quickie answer for that. But I mean, I mean someone like Sparky had a, a moral point of view. And it was standing up for the kids or, or you know, sh telling and saying what, what, what it was really like for them you know, to experience you know, embarrassment or humiliation or whatever it was. Um, and you know he he throws scripture in there every now and then, um, never heavy-handedly. Uh, that's that's one example. Um, but I just think Walt Kelly certainly had a point of view. I mean he had uh, McCarthyism going on and he didn't hold back at all, even though he was warned to back off. Uh, but he he laid into Joe McCarthy, no problem. So I feel like that you should you should have some kind of a feeling like that. Your Shazam book, would you? That seemed like that had a point of view. Well, it it hadn't. It looked more like it. It did have a point of view. It was about you know, war profiteering, 
But it, what, at, what people forget is that at the time, in the DC universe, Lex Luthor was president. Mm. There, that's prescience for you, huh? <laughs> <laughs> and um, so they had, they had the biggest villain in the universe was actually the president. Uh -huh. So I made um, Dr. Savannah, who was a scientific genius but evil, I made him uh, the Secretary of State. And um, because, you know, I, I didn't like Dick Cheney all that much. And uh, uh, I, I, wanted to, I wanted to talk about that kind of yeah. thing. So um, there you go. Yeah, that's great. Your question was better than mine, so I'm glad you went. No. No. <laughs> I think we should open it up yeah. for, uh, unless there's something we didn't ask you that you would like to say, or we'll open it for questions. Well, I, I, let me just say, since we are here in, uh, the, at the Schultz Museum celebrating the 15th anniversary, I'm very grateful uh, to you, to, the, to everybody that works here, to Jeannie, to my dear friend Rosie, for bringing me out here to be part of this. Because if you read Bone, there's no question I wear my love of Sparky on my sleeve. Those characters are, uh, I mean, they obviously just from the eyes and the, the eyebrows, and there, that's where I got that was from Peanuts. And also the, the characters themselves, even though I didn't ever consciously do this, I mean, you've got Phone Bone, who's always constantly being embarrassed. And you've got, but he's always trying to do the right thing. And you've got Phony Bone, who's completely selfish and whiny and cranky like Lucy. And, and, and Smiley Bone is kind of like the magical character in there. So um, I, I wouldn't have probably even been interested in cartooning if it wasn't for Sparky. And it had a great impact on me. So I want to say that as long as I'm sitting here. So let's yeah. start. Um, Jessica has a microphone if you have questions. What is your favorite character um, from Bone? I think that it's probably Phone Bone because he's the one I made up first when I was five years old. And he's also the one that I kind of want to be like the most. I want to be kind of like a good guy, you know, and um, try to, you know, and try to solve problems and stuff. But then a lot of times I'm pretty selfish and whiny, so. <laughs> He's a bone. <laughs> From Boneville. <laughs> He's just, I mean, they're just, they're just kind of like little made up characters. Like I said, I didn't mean to do that. I just forgot. They're bony people. Yeah, there's two, uh, two over here. I don't know if you can read. They're not hard, though. I think they're soft and squishy. <laughs> they're a styrofoam bone. They're, yeah, they're like a Nerf bone. <laughs> um, why uh, was, like, Boneville's technology, like, ahead of, like, the world that um, Thorne was in? Like, because Boneville had, like, paper money, and they were still, like, using... They didn't know what paper money was. Yeah, and yeah. Like other things, like they traded eggs, and Phony didn't know about that, and none of them did. So why was it like that? Why was it like that? It was like that because I thought it would be funny to take modern cartoon characters like Donald Duck and Uncle Scrooge and put them in The Lord of the Rings. And the Lord of the Rings, you know, is like a fantasy world that takes place in the Middle Ages, and it's pre-technological um, existence. There's no electricity. Uh, they have to use carts to haul things around from their farms. And uh, I just thought it'd be good fish-out-of-water humor uh, and be really mean to Phony Bone to throw him in a world where there was no money. Um, and, you know, and I just tried to justify it by separating the land of the valley by mountains and, and uh, deserts, vast deserts, uh, and pretend that in Boneville they didn't have airplanes. And <laughs> they just fly over the valley and find them. Uh, what, what was the Great Red Dragon inspired by? That is a good question. Um, I had done a couple of drawings of Phone Bone when I was trying to figure out what this fantasy world was going to be. And at first, I had to be more like a Conan the Barbarian guy with a big sword. And he was fighting this dragon. And the dragon, and the, 
the, the weird balls on the end of his ears started out in the early drawings as just like, you know, like a cat. You ever see a cat's ears? And they have that one big line of, of hair on the, the leading edge. That's kind of how they started out. But as I drew them, they just kind of moved out. Every drawing, they come out a little further. I was at San Diego one time, and I had a big picture of Phone Bone kicking back on the dragon's back. It was a huge picture of him on the dragon. And this dad and his little kid walked by, and the dad goes, Dad, look. It's a Christmas donkey. It's a Christmas donkey. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, but funny. That, but so this dragon that I always drew him fighting, he kind of eventually I started having him help Phone Bone and then became his friend. So that's where he came from. Um, why are the humans not startled when they see a little man that basically looks like a ghost? That is a very good question. I'll have to ask them sometime. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, it, seriously, I always thought that was funny. I actually thought that was funny that, that th they would just go in there and, and just not realize that they're not people. Like Bugs Bunny would like dress up like a beautiful woman. And like Elmer Fudd would like want to marry him. Right. It's like, he's gray with fur. Right. Only if his tail fell out or something, would right. Elmer would be like, what? I had no idea when I saw your buck teeth and your whiskers. <laughs> <laughs> I still think it's funny. That, that reminds me of something that uh, Mr. Schultz, Sparky, said once. I can't remember if he, if, if he said it or if I heard him say it in a talk, but he said, that you have all these different genres and comics, you can do things in comics you can't do in anything else. So things are plausible in comics that aren't plausible in any other medium. And he broke that rule, was one of the first people to really break right. that rule and knew how to do it. Yeah, so he made like, that up. Cartoonists should embrace that, you yeah. know what I mean? Like the, all, the, all the examples that you just gave. Yeah. Anyway, sorry. Why aren't there any images of Boneville in any of the uh, Bone series? You know, I, I, that's a, I get asked that a lot, and I have a really weird answer. You ready? I was going to show it. My plan was, after we got into the story a little bit, I would have foam bones start to tell the story, and we'd have a flashback. But I had two things going on. I kind of started thinking about certain kind of rules that I wanted to follow, comic rules, cartooning rules. And one was, I didn't want to show thought balloons. And, you know, I, I was like, you can't see somebody thinking, right? So I'm just going to only, you, they either, you can either tell by their face or you, they'll say it. So no thought balloons and no flashbacks. I thought that that had been kind of overused in comics over the years. Uh, and the other thing was people started writing letters to me and telling me what they thought Boneville looked like. And it was everything from, like, like weird ant hills on the moon to you know crazy mushroom towns and futuristic cities and i thought i think i'm going to let everybody have their own boneville and i just will never show boneville and that's a big fight i've had with every studio that's wanted to do a bone movie they want to start in boneville right off the bat and i explained to them this this precious thing that every individual reader has and they don't care <laughs> well, and, and just to piggyback on the Sparky notion, he ne you never saw the inside of Snoopy's doghouse, and you never see the little red-haired girl. It, it exists never in our, see the little red -haired our girl. imaginations. So I saw her. <laughs> yes. Hi. Was it? I was wondering. Was it uh, outside of the three comics that you have up there, the novels that you've done? Was it? How did you get into like doing Marvel or Simpsons? And how did people come to uh, start coming to you, hey, we would like you to do this or do that or other things like, like that? Uh, usually, well, there was a period in like the first couple of years of Bone, uh, it was a real struggle to get people to read it. But it's, when it did, it was people like Neil Gaiman liked it. And when Neil, and Neil was like, just suddenly had just become like super hot in the comic book world. And when he would go, he would be on a television show or something, and that's for comics, and say, I'm reading Bone. And people, it just, there was a real period in the mid 90s where it, it, it got really hot. And I would, they would just call me, like someone from uh, Bongo Comics on behalf of Matt Groening would call me and ask if I would do a, a Simpsons Treehouse of Terror. Uh, like that, I would just do. A, I did a lot of individual, smaller pieces like that. Um, 
the Shazam book with DC came later, near the end, when I think people were, I was starting to say, I'm getting near the end, and Bone is one big story, uh, and the end is coming. And he, I got contacted by Mike Carlin, who was the editor-in-chief at that time. And he said, uh, after you finish Bone, you want any interest in superheroes? And I didn't have any interest in superheroes, honestly. Um, but I, I was like, well, I'm not going to. I'm not going to be rude. What if it's some, I don't know. I didn't know. What could it be? I called him back. And he said, how about Captain Marvel, uh, the Shazam guy? And I'm like, oh. He had had a lot done to him. He did have a, like Jerry Ordway did a book that was pretty good. But it, had, it hadn't really, it had run its course. And uh, otherwise, he was not, had not become grim and gritty like all the other superheroes had. Uh, plus, he had. You know, his power came from mythology, which I liked. And it had a talking tiger, for God's sakes. That's, people used to, when they found out I was doing it, people go, you're not going to do the talking tiger, are you? And I'm like, are you kidding? That's why I Absolutely, took this. Yeah. <laughs> it's the best part. Um, so in, uh, in virtually every case, I was someone gave me a call. And if I wanted to do it, I did it. Are there any like little secrets or Anything you had fun like hiding in the books? Yes. These are tough questions, man. Yeah. Wow. But they're secrets. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a lot of there are a lot of little what we call like, Easter eggs, but uh, and I'm trying to think of one off the top of my head, but they're mostly just little throw callbacks to for comic book people that you know there might be some reference to something. You know, in a Snoopy joke, or I know I did an asterisk thing in an early Tukey comic where he, he's wearing this giant. Um, you can saw in that one picture a silhouette. He looks like a big fat guy wearing this like giant coat made out of leaves, and he he has to get through a little crack in the wall to get this food, and he just takes it off, and it just stands there, and he walks out. He's a little skinny guy. That's a that's an exact reference to uh, a joke in um, Asterix the Legionnaire. So I have lots and lots of little things like that that I, you know, I thought I that was really back funny to too when I saw that. Was that, that a good joke? Yeah, that was yeah. a really good joke. I, did, I didn't make it. It up. was unexpected. <laughs> <laughs> it was unexpected. And I, I thought I caught an homage to Albert Al Alligator in a crowd scene in Bone. Yes, there was. He had an alligator with a cigar in his mouth. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He didn't look. He didn't look like Albert, but he looked like a, he looked like the old, the early Bumbazine Albert. Oh, okay. How are we on time? I'm not sure what time we started exactly. Do you know, Lex? Okay. Okay. Are you ever going to make um, a book about a journey back to Boneville? Probably not. I'm sorry. <laughs> I like to visit with the characters again. I, I don't think I'm ever going to do a really big sequel like that. But um, next spring, uh, I'm doing a picture book with Scholastic Star with Smiley Bone. So it's like a 40-page uh, picture book. That'll be cool. Yeah, it, it was fun to do, and that, that'll be fun. So I'm going to still draw the Bone characters. I probably won't do a, a big sequel, and I'm not going to draw Boneville. <laughs> How did you land on using uh, Nikola Tesla in Razzle? I was actually working on the story itself. I wanted this noir story, and I wanted the parallel universes. And I had, I had even come up with the triangle of the guy, the femme fatale, and the villain. And I needed for there to be something that they were all after so that they could chase each other through the parallel dimensions. Um, and I stumbled on the Philadelphia experiment, which led me to Tesla, which led me to Tesla's lost journals, which is a huge conspiracy theory. And I was like, bingo, I have my Maltese Falcon. Tesla's Lost Journals. And then I was just fascinated by, and, and we all know Tesla now, but in 2007, there are less, I'll say less people knew, let's say that. And I, he was a shock to me to discover this figure who invented and patented almost everything we use now from uh, electrical outlets to radios to everything. Drones. Hmm. He freaking invented drones. Oh, I'm, I was. I'm sorry. Okay, I'm we were going to get that. one, right. two, and then maybe one more question. So let's pass this all the way. So. What's the story behind the hooded one? 
I, I, the story is I was doing a proto version of Bone in my college newspaper. I was kind of getting to learn to know the characters. And I didn't have a really big story worked out. But I did know that the villain was going to be uh, Grandma Ben's sister. Uh, and I needed to hide her face so you wouldn't know that. Uh, and maybe that's why I, part of why I made the word balloon kind of half whisper, half creepy going up. So it wouldn't necessarily be obvious to the other people in the world whether she was male or female. Uh, so to hide her, and then uh, I guess as I started drawing her, she just started looking like the figure of death. So I gave her the scythe and all that. Is that, you, you buy that? All right, good. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Jeff. Um, so in our comic book shop, we have parents that come up with kids. The kids want to make comic books uh, like you do and other people do. What do you recommend to the parents of kids who want to do this? Like, how did your parents nurture you with your talent in, in the storytelling and such? Well, first of all, where's your shop? Hunter Plains Comics on 7th and Okay, go see him. Go see this gentleman. Um, uh, I would, I mean, my parents were pretty understanding. I, I think they were confused. I mean, they, they seemed to think I could draw. They didn't really push me in any other direction. Because uh, by the time I went to college, I was pretty hell-bent on getting a comic strip syndicated in the newspaper. And when I couldn't, I, I discovered the underground comics and the self-publishing and, and did it kind of the bass awkward way. Uh, what I would recommend is to just have them get the supplies and let them start getting used to real tools. Even if nowadays it's more like on computers, I don't know, maybe that's the idea. Uh, when I was a kid, it was, the trick was how does it, you go, I would draw my comic in pencil and then go to a copier at the library, put a dime in, and they wouldn't copy. This was, I mean, back then you couldn't even make adjustments for darkness, you know, and I, I went to the librarian and I said, well, how does this work? And she got me a book on inking cartoons, like editorial cartoons, and that just blew my mind. So whatever, whatever I, I think it's the tools are big. Raina, what do you think? Raina, you've got, Raina Telgemeier over here has more, has more children readers and more young girls than anybody I know. You must come into this question. Yeah, I Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean Hi, to marry um, I mean, advice for kids getting started. I mean, I, I grew up reading Jeff's work. And by grew up, I mean I found it in college because it didn't really exist before then because I'm old. But um, I mean, I was reading comic strips in the paper, and then I read Bone. And Bone was what really clicked for me, that graphic novels, not just short form stories, but long form storytelling was a thing. But that didn't mean that I sat down and tried to write 1,300 pages for my first project. I started making mini comics and I started telling short stories. And my longest story before I was published uh, as an author was eight pages long. So um, start small. That's my first advice to anybody because it's really satisfying to write something with a concrete beginning, middle, and end, even if it's only in one page. Uh, if you can do that, you can then get better at telling longer stories too. Good advice. Hold your questions and uh, get them at the table for signing. And I think we have one more thing right over here. Hello, Jeff. Hello, Michael. <laughs> so uh, my name is Michael Johnson. I'm here with Andrew Ferrago. Uh, we're from uh, the Cartoon Art Museum in San Francisco, and we're delighted to be here uh, celebrating Jeff and the 15th anniversary of the Charles M. Schultz Museum. Um, yes, give it up for the museum. And uh, the Cartoon Art Museum, which we're closed right now, we're reopening again this fall. We've been around for about 30 years. Um, and before this museum opened up, we partnered with uh, Sparky and Jeannie to develop uh, an award that we would give uh, every few years for people oh. in the industry that were having an impact both from a creative perspective, but also from an educational perspective. and. <clears throat> And so we're delighted today to uh, award oh, the wow. Sparky to our friend, oh, wow. <laughs> Jeff Smith. Wow. Holy <laughs> cow. 
Wow. That is beautiful. Thank you very much. Andrew, is it the Oh, this is wonderful. Thanks, pal. That's very nice. That's really cool. Man. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Well, um, I have to say that is the best looking award I have ever seen. That is really sweet. It weighs more than an Oscar. Yeah. <laughs> I gotta carry this and the dragon. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. I am really touched and humbled. And uh, I think as I, for, you can tell from what I've said tonight, you know, that this is actually really hitting me. So I'm not gonna say any more. <laughs> very exciting. Thank, Thank you. Guys. Thank you very much. Congrats. Uh, So please join us. Uh, please join us outside for a book signing uh, in the Great Hall. Thank you so much. Uh, trick me.